Thanks for listening to this teaching from City of Life Church. Check out www.col.tv for more great teachings, service times, and information on upcoming events. Now, let's join the service already in progress. Series. Thank you for coming today at the beginning of our brand new series called Joseph, The Power of Dreams. I love series. I love the beginning of a series. I think it's one of the most fun parts of the series is to kick it off and to frame everything. So today, before I get into my actual series, uh, I want to touch on a couple things and I'm going to jump right in. Number one, I want to give an update on my wonderful son, Jude. We've been walking through, uh, you know, some, some challenges in, in a very trying, difficult situation with our family. Uh, you know, Jude has just completed his uh, first full round of chemo. He, he starts his second round on this Tuesday. And so right now is the time uh, in this last month, these, these couple of days before the new th- round starts is when he's feeling the best and dealing with, uh, just cha- it's just challenging, it's just a hard thing. Uh, but you know what's really cool today is my boy is here today in the service over here. So we're glad to see Jude. We love you, Jude. You're the man. <laughs> Woo! He didn't want me to do that, but I couldn't, I couldn't help myself. We love this kid. <laughs> We're proud of you, man. You're inspiring to all of us, and, and uh, we appreciate you and just glad to be able to worship with you today. Uh, special. You know, I'll tell you something that as far as our family goes, uh, over the years as pastors, I have been there for people in some really tough situations and learned how to give uh, of myself in, in hard situations and to, you know, maybe if it, it doesn't seem convenient sometimes to do certain things, but it all goes along with the calling. I don't ever complain about it or anything like that because it's just what I'm supposed to do. What I have not done over the years, and it's been more difficult for me to do, if I'm just being completely honest with you, is to let people help me. I find myself just by nature, not wanting people to think that I'm taking advantage of their kindness or whatever. But what's interesting is this is one situation, since we've never been anything like this, through something like this before, I'm learning what it feels like to let my church family help me and love me and be there for me and my family in a new way. So I haven't turned, anyone when people are like, can I cook you dinner? I'm like, oh yeah, you guys can cook us dinner. (laughs) Cookies, oh yeah, cookies too. Can we drive someone here? Can we pick this up? We're just saying yes to a lot of stuff because I, I'm starting to understand that's what actual family is. It's, it's when everyone does what they're good at to help one another, and that's what we can be to each other. So I just wanna say from the bottom of my heart to our staff, just our team and our friends and these covenant leaders that have been up here and everyone else, we love you guys so much. There's no way to express how it feels to know people are praying for my family and, and there for me. So thank you for also gracefully letting me walk through this, right? Be able to talk about it a little bit every week and go through this journey with you. We're gonna see uh, a victory, amen? Yeah. And so I'm excited about it. All right, so um, they talked about Love Strong, but I had to give a quick uh, promo for Love Strong. It is February the 24th. It's gonna be so fun, so amazing. Earl and Onika, if you don't know them, are some of Pastor Amy and my favorite people in the world. They are so sweet pastor, an exploding church, multiple campuses in Dallas, uh, to even have them, they're the, some of the most sought after speakers in the world. Uh, they don't have to come to something like this. Uh, they have so much going on, but they said, we would really love to be with you guys. So please make plans. Even if your wedding is this day, just cancel it and come to this. This is more important. I mean, wouldn't you rather learn about what a marriage is supposed to be than just, oh, let's just get married. Let's, let's just go through this thing where we're learning what marriage is and strengthening our marriage. That's how important this day is. And I really encourage you to be there. Also next week, uh, I did get a note here. This is not mine, but they said on uh, the, the fan Sunday next week, for some reason, there's no... New Giants jerseys allowed. I'm not sure what that's about, but uh, just reading it off the thing here. Uh, okay, let's move on and start the series. Uh, Genesis 50, 20 is our text for the day. And um, I, this is a, a, a text that is worth memorizing. You know, but I, I memorized the King James Version. I'm gonna read to you the, the New International Version. 
uh, which says you intended to harm me. So that can be to a person, if, if you're making this scripture through the lens of who you are, can be the enemy, the devil, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So it means God didn't cause it, but he's going to use it. He didn't make it happen, but he's going to make something happen from it. And then it says, let's just stop right there. 20, we'll just go right there and I'll pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your faithfulness and your goodness. I pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to move in this service, move in people that are watching online, the same spirit that's in this room. Let people catch that that are watching online. If it's just through a podcast or any way people are digesting this service and getting this information, Lord, let your anointing be upon it so that their hearts feel hope and they're challenged by your goodness and your presence. Holy Spirit, let miracles take place all over this room today. People that are sick and have needs, let them get set free from addictions, Lord, and, and bitterness and brokenness in their life. Let marriages be restored right now through the preaching of the word. You can do that if we have faith, and we have faith today to believe that you're a miracle-working God. Let it happen. Fill people's hearts with hope. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said. Amen. Come on, everybody said. Amen. Amen. You know, when you are telling a story, it's very customary to start it with once upon a time. Uh, we go to the beginning and we like to build the framework and the groundwork for what normal looks like. And then someone that typically is looking for something gets thrust out of their comfort zone, put in a different world where they have to go seek and find something. And then once you find something, you eventually change and you return to the place that you started. Those are just the principles of storytelling. But sometimes when you watch a movie, Somebody will tell the story a little out of order, and some of those happen to be some of my favorite movies. Uh, number one, I love this movie called The Usual Suspects by Brian Singer. It's, it's, it's kind of an older movie. I mentioned it in my book, Jesus First, Jesus Always, because there's a really great twist in The Usual Suspects. But one of the things that's really cool about this movie is that the beginning of the movie is the end. It starts with the ending. So you're seeing this extremely dramatic situation that you know something is like the, the, the intensity is turned up. Somebody's about to die. It's happening right there. It's not like it's not introducing you to anything. You're just right at the climax of the film. And then once it shows it, it goes back and shows how it got to that spot. Another one of my favorite movies by one of my favorite directors, Christopher Nolan, directed a movie called The Prestige. If you've never seen it, it's got Hugh Jackman. Uh, it's so, so good. The beginning of the movie starts with this shot of all these hats everywhere, and you can't figure out what these hats are. You don't even realize you're watching the same shot as the end of the movie, but then it works its way and builds the story. Even Forrest Gump, another great director, Robert Zemeckis, Forrest Gump, when you really think about Forrest Gump, him sitting on the bench saying life is like a box of chocolates, telling his story to people, that's from the third act of the movie, and he goes back and shows you the beginning part, how it builds up to that. So I am going to use that unique method today in our uh, series. I'm going to start with the end of the story of Joseph in our dream series. I'm gonna start with where the whole story lands. I'm going to start with how you frame the whole entire thing. And then in the following weeks, as we talk about the details of how it got there, you're going to hear the traditional story of how, you know, 12, 12 brothers, there's a brother that's the favorite, and he tells the other brothers that he had a dream that he was ruling over them. And they get jealous because he's got this really hot looking coat that his dad gave him. And there's really, they're mad at him because he seems arrogant. He comes back and gives him another dream that he's gonna be ruling over not just the brothers, but the parents as well. So they decide and plot to kill him. And at the last minute, one of the brothers says, let's don't kill him, let's just throw him in this pit. So they throw him in this pit and leave him for dead. And he is picked up by a, a different group of people that take him away from their homeland all the way to Egypt and sell him into slavery. So once he's sold into slavery, he finds himself in a, a man's house named Potiphar, who is a very influential man. Because he has such excellence in his life, and he's smart and intelligent and, and kind, and he's, he's God-fearing, he's a man of faith, he's elevated to the top of this guy's house and runs his house impeccably. 
The guy trusts him with everything, even trusts him to be at home with his older hot cougar wife, who at some point starts wanting to like hook up with Joseph. Uh, and she tries to hook up with him, and he's like, are you crazy? You're Potiphar's wife. I don't want to die. I wouldn't do it anyways. He's been so kind to me. Plus, I like younger girls. What's going on with you? This is kind of weird. And so she goes after him to the level where she actually grabs his clothes, and he runs away while she's grabbing the clothes and leaves the clothes in her hands. Uh, that's how he's so much he, he, he wants to do the right thing, and he gets away. And she gets so upset when he dodges this affair that she lies and says that he tried to force himself on her, which gets him thrown in prison. While he's in prison, he's amazing. He works his way to the top of the prison. His dad so eloquently put a couple weeks ago, no matter where you are, if you're always with God, he'll elevate you to the top of where you are, whether it's the pit, the prison, or the palace. The same way, he, he rises to the top of the prison he interprets some dreams. Finally, somebody tells Pharaoh, hey, this guy in prison interpreted my dream. You had a dream. No one can interpret it. Talk to him. He interprets Pharaoh's dream. He rises up to the top. Pharaoh says, you're the best I've ever seen. You're going to be my second in command in the most successful, wealthy city in the world. So Joseph goes from the lowest of the low to the highest of the high. It's the kind of story that we all love. It's the kind of story that inspires us because we think, hey, all those haters out there that don't believe in my dream, if I just keep moving forward, they're all gonna become these suckers that bow down to me and I'm gonna have everything. Like we kind of think in, in, in that kind of way, but I wanna challenge us a little bit today to look deeper in this story to maybe one of the reasons why God trusted Joseph to give him this kind of dream. Why God trusted Joseph and why Joseph never seemed to crack under the pressure of all these, uh, not only trials, but that, that seem to increase. Each trial seems to increase and get more and more pressure. Why didn't he break under the weight of that pressure? What was so outstanding about him? Was it just his temperament or was there something deeply spiritual that maybe we've never tapped into completely? Well, I think I have an idea about that. Let's, let's look here at Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. It's our text scripture. Now, by the way, as the story continues to unfold, he's not only second in command, but finally, that dream that he had about his brothers bowing down to him where they were all like wheat and they were bowing down to his wheat. Egypt is in an actual famine 22 years later. His brothers come looking for food and he recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. So it, it, his dream completely comes true. And finally, he kind of puts them through a couple of tests, says, hey, go back and get your little brother. And he's just kind of messing with them a little bit because he wants to see if they're really sorry. He, he cries and weeps several times because he misses his brother so bad. Finally, after all is said and done, and we'll get into this in the series, he makes up with them and, and admits who he is. He says, I'm Joseph. And, and th their relationship is kind of mended. That's when he says this. He says, you intended to harm me. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives, starting with yours. It's funny that you thought you were going to kill me. I end up saving you. Right? So then don't be afraid. I'll provide for you and your children. <laughs> and he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. I think that tells us a little bit about Joseph's character there. It says Joseph stayed in Egypt along with all his father's family. He lived 110 years. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he's speaking to his brothers prophetically about what's about to happen to Israel that Israel is going to become enslaved to Egypt. And he says that even though I'm about to die and you guys have to come to Egypt, instead of following after what the Lord wanted for your life in, in, in Israel, you guys have messed up and now you need the help of the world. Well, it just so happens I'm second in command in the world and I'm helping God's people. But what he says here is he's making a promise. He said, God will come to your aid. He will take you. He was talking about the exodus that Israel would become enslaved to Egypt, this beautiful, amazing culture that now is like lost in the culture of Egypt. For, for hundreds of years, you're going to eventually become enslaved. 
He said, but God will surely come to your aid, take you up out of this land to the land that he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now listen to this. And Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. I want to focus on that for a second, because I don't hear a lot of people talking about that part in the story. Where, I mean, not a lot of people say stuff like that. Swear that you'll take my bones and bury them somewhere else. That's what he says. He, he makes the Israelites promise this. This is a man who has had incredible faith, who has had an incredible dream that almost no one sees a dream like this come to pass. It's literally materialized in front of his, his eyes. He's at the end of his life. He's already got everything you could imagine having, yet there's more for him even after his life is over. His destiny is not complete. He's not comfortable knowing that he's just second in command. He's not comfortable enough knowing that all these amazing things have taken place. He says, I want you to move on from Egypt. God is going to take you out of here. And when you get back to our home, just take my bones and bury them there because that represents God's promise. That represents God's favor. He had vision that extended beyond his own life and beyond his own personal destiny. As a matter of fact, when we look at the story of Joseph, one of the most ex extraordinary figures in the Old Testament, everybody loves Joseph. As a matter of fact, I think Joseph, Daniel, and Jesus are three characters that a lot of biblical scholars say are perfect in that they have no flaws. They're some of the only characters that have, and, and, and figures in the Bible that have no flaws. They just don't do anything wrong. Uh, so it, it's interesting that as loved as he is and appreciated as he is, he's not really mentioned in the New Testament. Really only one place he's mentioned. And in that place that he's mentioned, it doesn't talk about his dream. It doesn't talk about the pit. It doesn't talk about the prison. It doesn't talk about the palace. Do you know what it actually talks about? It's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 22. It says, it was by faith. Somebody say faith. That means Joseph was a faith man. Yeah. It was by faith that Joseph, when he was about to die, said confidently that the people of Israel would leave Egypt. Yeah. So he was prophesying about the future of Egypt before he died. The future of Israel leaving Egypt before he died says he even commanded them to take his bones with them when they left. That's what the New Testament says about Joseph. So as far as legacies are concerned, if you're summarizing what's extraordinary about people, and I think the New Testament is a pretty good example of what we should remember people by. What he's remembered by, by the New Testament writers, is his faith. Yes. Yes. That he believed in something that was so big it extended beyond his life. So I challenge you, if your dream is not big enough that it goes beyond you and touches other people, it's probably not a God dream. I mean, if your dream is only about the size of your house or the kind of car that you can have, that's just really not, uh, it's, it's just not, it's not a faith dream. Yeah, right. It might take faith to believe some elements of the things that, that you're believing for your life. I understand that, but I'm just saying we have to let our dreams get stretched big enough that it can encompass multiple people. Yeah, yeah. That's what we see in his life. And we see then that this is not just something he says, it's something that Israel keeps the promise. Exodus chapter 13, verse 19. It says, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones with you from this place. So Moses, when he's leaving Egypt years later, he says, go grab, go grab Joseph's bones. He made Israel promise, and we're about to get up out of here. We're going to the promised land. Because he said, Joseph said that God was going to deliver us from Egypt, and I've got Joseph's bones. He's one of the most important men in our faith, and I got his bones, so I know if I got these bones that God's going to lead me to the place where I can bury these bones. 
He ain't going to abandon me. I got news for you. God has done too much for you. He's spoken too much over you. He's given you too much confirmation in your life. He ain't going to leave you walking around with bones, no place to bury them. Come on, look at somebody and say, I believe it today. Woo. I don't know about you, but I never really locked onto that passage before. That's hot. And it goes on to say in Joshua chapter 24, verse 32, it says, Joseph's bones. I never even knew it talked about Joseph's bones so much. Joseph's bones, which the people of Israel had bought from Egypt, they buried in Shechem. Where was that? The promised land. That means after Moses passed it off and gave it to Joshua, someday they said, we got to keep our promise because God spoke to us so many years ago through that man that was a dreamer that had the faith to see God in the first place. So let's keep our end of the bargain. And Joseph ended up getting his resting place. His final resting place on this planet was the promised land. Man, I hope my dream is big enough that people are doing, not necessarily digging up my bones, but I hope my dream is big enough that when I'm gone, people are still talking about my life. What I did for the, not just my life, but what I did for the kingdom. Things that I spoke over the king, they say, oh, man, Pastor Jeff said many years ago that we we're going to do this. We got to keep going down this road. And then their dreams start expanding and their dreams start expanding. Man, think about the faith that it takes for this to take place. And as great as, a, as the dream was, as great as the journey was, Joseph's dream was just a small part of God's master plan. And he knew it. He still needed faith at the end of his life to believe that Israel was going to leave Egypt one day and his bones would be buried in the promised land. Are you still full of faith today? Come on, look at somebody next to you and say, I'm full of faith. Look at someone next to you on the other side and say, I'm, I'm glad I get to sit next to a faith person today. If you're watching online, just type all that and press enter. Press return. Uncommon dreams require uncommon faith. It's going to take faith. And, you know, I want to define faith a little bit today, just so, so you're not just frustrated by saying, oh, what, what does that mean? I just got to sit there and go, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. I, I know that can be frustrating when we don't know how to build our faith. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So I would say one thing. Keep the word in your spirit on a regular basis. I would say take notes in church. Go back home. Read those notes. Uh, study those notes. Uh, practice them. Rehearse them. Talk to people about it. Memorize scripture. Uh, lock in. A lot of people say, well, I'm not getting fed. Well, I mean, you know, when, when it comes to church, the shepherd is supposed to lead you into the field, but he doesn't come and stick the food in your mouth and go like this. You have to eat it yourself, right? Can I get an Amen. You can bring me to your house and make me red velvet cake, and I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to eat it myself. I don't need your help. I'm going to eat it. So in the same way as, as believers, when we're trying to develop our faith, let's get in the Word. Let's, let's read the Bible regularly, study it, get in our spirit if we want to build our faith. But let's also remember what faith is. Faith starts with what we believe about God. It's not simply what we believe from God. It's what we, be we believe about God. A.W. Tozer, one of my favorite authors, said, you can tell everything you need to know about a person by what first comes to their mind when talking about God. The most important thing about us is what comes to our mind when we think of God. And what I love about, so, so really quick before I get into Joseph, what comes to your mind when you think about God? Do you think God is this old, vengeful dude with a white beard that's like throwing lightning bolts at people that cuss and people that cut people off and people who have multiple Netflix accounts? I mean, what, what, is, your th what is your thought of, of God, who he is? Is that really who you think he is? Or is he fully good? Does he love you and really want the best for you in every situation? 
Because if you believe that, then you're starting to get what faith really, really is. That's why if you're a faith person, you actually believe Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things work together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Woo. If you, if you believe that he's good, then you can believe that all things work together for your good. But if you don't believe that he's fully good, then you don't believe all things work together. You get mad at God when something happens that you didn't expect or something that you didn't like. It's like, oh, look, no red lights. God is good. Well, buddy, don't drive down Osceola Parkway because you'll think he's terrible. You're going to be stuck on that joker. We can't have that mentality when it comes to God. We've got to know what does that mean? All things work together. It means that when I know God is good and I am a faith person, that I am fully aware that God will use good things for my good. He will use neutral things for my good and he will use bad things for my good. You say, well, what does that mean that he will use neutral things? What are neutral things? Well, I remember one time my family, we were in our car years ago. If you ask them, they'll remember it. We were sitting at a red light on Canoe Creek Road getting off the turnpike. It was very late. I think it was like 10, 30 or 11. We were coming back from a movie or something like that. No one really out on the road. And somebody from the back had, had a phone or something and said, hey, check, let's check out this song by Banks. Banks is just like a pop artist in they said, I want to hear this song. So I, I'm sitting there with my foot on the brake, turn around, look around. I'm at a red light. We're kind of doing something, playing a song. Oh, yeah, that's, that's good. So I look up, and the light has been green. So I, I go, I take my foot off the brake, and I go. And when I go, these two cars hit each other head on. Literally would have completely pancaked me and my, on one side and my family on the other side, huge head-on collision right in front of us. We would have died. And I'm sitting there at a green light that I would have gone if, so, if they did not say, hey, let's look at this song. So you know what? Banks, when she was in there like, yeah, play that one more time. I want another take. You know, I don't even know what she was doing the day she recorded that. She ain't good. She ain't bad. She knew, uh, it's just a neutral song. That's a way that God used something that is either good or bad. He used just a song. In that moment, he said, I'll use a song if I want to save my sons and my daughters. I'll use anything I want. I'll use a good thing, a bad thing, a neutral. All things work together for my good. You do something good for me, God's going to work it for my good. You do something that's neutral for me, God will work it for my good. You say, oh, well, I'm going to do something bad. God will work it for my good. Why? Because that's what I believe in my, that's what my faith tells me. My faith tells me that he is good. See, when your heart is right, God will give you a dream that can change the world. When your heart believes and knows that he is good, God will give you the kind of dream that will change the world. So keep your heart right. Even when you're hurting, keep your heart right. You know what? I understand that what you've been through is not fair. It doesn't feel fair. We want justice. We want fairness. It's, I mean, we just feel that even societally, so many people talk about fairness. This is not fair. That's not fair. I understand that. But you know, when it comes to our relationship with God, there is this thing called trust. We have to trust in his sovereignty. And that means his sovereignty simply means he really does what he wants. But his providence means that he does it in a wonderful, loving, and caring way. It's not just sovereign saying, you know what? Uh, I'm just going to hurt this person. I'm going to help this person. It's not like that. It's that he does whatever he wants, but he does it in a way that he provides for us in a wonderful, caring, loving way. We have to trust in that. We can spend the rest of our lives, each one of us. And I mean, my heart breaks when I get in a big group of people and I know the tough things they've been through. Because I mean, I just look at my family or just the people that I know. When I hear the abuse, the, the pain, the suffering, the sickness, the disease, the death, the loss of family members, just the, 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 the traumatic things that we go through. We could literally spend the rest of our lives 
comparing everything, saying, I don't understand. This person, it happened to them, and they went to church every day, and yet there's all these people out there that hate God. They curse. They've been married 10 times. They cheat people. They lie, and they never had this problem. That this And we could spend our whole lives asking why, or we could be like Joseph. We could say, as for you, you thought evil of me, but God, he didn't cause it but he meant it for good. He saw your plan and he said, I'm going to take that plan and I'm going to use it not only to protect and develop my kid, but I'm going to bless everybody through him. Even some of the people that tried to hurt him. See, that's the difference is our knowing that he's good, being convinced that he's good. And if you're here today and you're not sure yet, let me compel you. He is good. He's trustworthy. He's faithful. He's Jehovah. He's Alpha. He is the Omega. He is everything in between. He is the sweetest rose of Sharon. He is El Shaddai. Come on, he's he's Elohim, the strong creator today. He's Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He's Jehovah Shalom, our peace. He's Jehovah Sidkenu, our righteousness. He's Jehovah Makedish, the one who sanctifies us. He's Jehovah Shalom, who is our peace. He's Jehovah Nisi. He's our banner that is above us today. He is good. Even when it doesn't feel good, he is good. We have to remind ourselves of that today. When it's not working out our way when we don't like the outcome, when we don't like the diagnosis. We don't agree with it. We don't appreciate it. We don't want to accept it. But what we do is in the middle of those moments, we say, okay, I know what I just heard. Or I know what just happened to me for things that have happened to you that Something got forced on you. You didn't want it. You didn't agree. It just something that happened in your life. Sometimes that includes someone that you love that walks out on you, that cheats on you, that abandons you. These are all, these are all traumatic things in our life. What we do is we take that information when we are faith people and we go, I see what just happened. I hear the diagnosis. I, I, I understand what just happened. And here it is. And it hurts. But it does not change who my God is. My God is good in that valley. My God is good on that mountaintop. He is good and I will believe he's good. And I will use these times of trials and suffering to let that suffering produce something at me in the valley that could never be produced on the mountaintop. James chapter 1, 2 says, Dear brothers, is your life full of difficulties and temptations? Can I answer that out loud? Yes! (laughs) He says, then be happy. For when the way is rough, your patience has a chance to grow. (laughs) So let it grow. Don't try to squirm your way out of your problems. That's literally the Bible I'm reading there. Stop trying to get out of every situation. What it's saying is feel it sometimes. Let it press in. You can feel the weight of it. You can be under the pressure of it. That's why Jesus said, come to me. All of you who are heavy laden. That means when you feel the pressure and it's weighing down on you. He says, and I will give you rest. Think about that pressure. You ever heard that old say pressure bust a pipe? (laughs) Pressure bust pipes. That's what my buddy used to tell me in school all the time. He said, oh man, pressure bust a pipe. And that, that basically means that if the pipe ain't strong enough, the pressure will bust it. But I got news for you. You can take pressure over time and put that to coal and that coal that's absolutely worthless becomes something that is priceless. 
And it's only the pressure that can produce that diamond. We try to squirm our way out. If, if Joseph would have done this, if he would have changed his view on God, imagine if the moment he got in the pit, if he thought, I thought you were good, right? Isn't that true? Imagine if he said, I thought you were good. I thought you said that, that I was going to be standing and my brothers were gonna be, gonna be kneeling. You lied to me. You gave me a false dream. See, when we only judge God on this micro level and we use the macro view of eternity. That's why last week I was talking about sometimes when people die early and are taken from this world in a way that we don't understand. But yet they were living for God and the trajectory of their life was one of faith. They were giving, they were investing, they were building, they were leading people to Christ. They were saying, someday I'm gonna do this, someday I'm gonna do that. And, and then it's boom, boom, something happens. And we just go, why, why, why? I thought they had a dream. I thought, no, God wanted to the, them to live on that trajectory because think of all the people around them that they elevated, that they pulled with them on that level, said, we're going here. And those people keep going. They keep moving up, keep moving further. When you back up from a bigger view of eternity, God said, I want you to live with faith. I want you to constantly believe at any moment that miracle could come. And a lot of times it will. Sometimes when it doesn't, we have to trust that bigger plan. We have to stop asking why so much and start asking what. What can I do to trust you more? What can I do right now that helps me believe more that you're good? See, if you lose your faith, you give up on your dream. Never surrender the dream. Never surrender the dream. Look at someone next to you, say, never surrender the dream. Look at the person on the other side, tell them, look tough at them, say, never surrender the dream. There's beauty in your brokenness. Beauty in your brokenness. There's treasure that can only be found in the brokenness. Joseph found some treasure in that pit. The Bible doesn't talk about it, but he did. Joseph found some treasure in that prison. It made him who he was. And you know, I think that sometimes we, as, as scripture says in that version right there, we try to squirm our way out so much when we're uncomfortable and we're experiencing challenges that we squirm out before we can figure out what the treasure was. And sometimes we try to forget about the past so much that we fail to recognize the treasure that we've gained since then. Like for instance, let me tell you this quick story. I heard an amazing, it's a true story of a 90 year old lady from France that several years ago wanted to move into an assisted living facility. So she hired a, a company to come and auction off all of her stuff so she could get the, move, the money to move into this place. So they came and they did an auction and they sold everything that she owned for $6,000. Now, she had some extra stuff left and they brought it to her. They said, we're just gonna throw this stuff away, literally throw it in the trash. Do you have need of any of this? Is any of it sentimental to you? She said, no, take it all. And this one guy saw this little picture. It was an eight by 10 uh, picture that had been hanging in her kitchen. Thousands and thousands of meals over the years had been cooked, just garlic, everywhere, you know, just spices, everything you can imagine. It was like kind of burnt looking because of how close it had been to the heat of the oven. And she said, no, I don't want it. And he took a look at it and could see some kind of picture on it. He said, well, I mean, what, I'll tell you what, I'll just have it appraised for you, just in case. So he has this thing appraised. It comes back from the appraiser that this picture is worth five to seven million dollars. It was called the mocking of Christ, that's the name of the photo, it was painted during the rena Renaissance. But here's, here's what's even crazier. So they put it up for auction, and the five to seven million dollar painting that was valued at five to seven million dollars actually sold for 27 million dollars. France, recently someone tried to bring it out of France. France made a move that it cannot leave the French borders because it's such a prize a priceless prize to that nation that represents the Renaissance. Something 
that was priceless was just in somebody's life every day that they failed to even recognize. A treasure that could have changed the way that she lived. She could have affected generations of people with her financial blessing. She could have become a philanthropist. Her family could have been changed. But she didn't understand the value of that treasure that was hanging right there in her life. She passed by it every day. I wonder what undiscovered treasure is in your life. Maybe from trauma that you've been through. You say, how could there ever be treasure? You know, when you bring up abuse, it's, it's just hard. You know, my mom has a book that's coming out in a couple of weeks. It's just going to be absolutely phenomenal. She talks about, in, in a way that no one ever has before, the abuse that she went through growing up. You say, how could that ever turn into something that you could find treasure in. Well, my mom, when we were growing up, had rules for us that she didn't have growing up to protect us. So my life looked different than her life because some of the things that she learned made her want to be a better parent than her parents were to her. The relationship, the way, the openness that she had, the willingness that she had to talk to me, to share her story with so many other people. The fact that when she got older, some of the things and the wounds that her dad told her said, you're too stupid to ever go to school. You, you'll never get in college. She didn't even graduate high school. She had her GED until she was 40 years old because she actually believed the things that her dad told her. But at some point, God healed her heart and she went back to school and not only <laughs> passed college with straight A's, she didn't even get a B during her PhD, she has a PhD in, in psychology, a doctor. She never got one B throughout school. And I call that treasure to be able to turn something broken like that into something that can affect so many people's lives. How could you find your treasure? You might have to do some searching. That's what Joseph did. The, the devil meant evil for his life, but God wanted to turn that into good. As you know, I've shared this before, but you know, I grew up from the time I was 13 so I was 30, around 33, 34. I was addicted to pornography. And I grew up a pastor's kid. I've been in ministry. I was ordained when I was 15 years old. I've literally been a, a pastor for 35 years. Most of that time, I had something that was gripping my life that I didn't know how to talk to people about. I tried to hide. There were a few times I tried to talk to people. I just wasn't really open about it. I was, I would do ministry. I love Jesus. I always love God. I want to do great things for God, but I would struggle with wanting to quit ministry, feeling not worthy of it, walking away, coming back. And my life was just falling apart until I went to a, a, a men's weekend where we got together and in that weekend, God just started overwhelming me with his love. And he said to me, Jeffrey, I loved you before that was a problem. I loved you when it's a problem and I'm gonna love you when it's not a problem anymore. And God completely set me free when I was in my early 30s. And you know, I mean, I've got my wife and my two beautiful daughters and my son that's sitting here. Do you think that that's something that if I could choose all the things in the world to talk about in front of my kids who I, who like my whole world is like trying to make sure that they respect me. I would try to come up with something else to talk about other than that if it wasn't treasure. The treasure is that, you know, a few years ago, my son's growing up, I got to talk to him about this subject. We sat there and cried together about how we wanna use my past mistakes and my failures in life so that we can be men of honor. Men of dignity, that's treasure that no one can ever take away from me that came from brokenness in my life. You can find the treasure like Joseph did if you believe God is good. And if you believe that you've never been through anything that God can't use for your good. That's really what's exceptional about him to me. That's the way I wanna kick off the story. I wanna to go to the ending. We'll work our way back. But we start from the fact that this is a man of faith. You know, when you're in the valley, you need some perspective. You can't see your way out of the valley. 
And down in the valley, the, the common idea is that things are going bad, that God is bad, if things are going good, God is good. But Joseph didn't make it an either or situation. He said, life is hard and you know what? God is good. Life is beautiful and you know what? God is good. And that's where we have to start. If we're gonna dream these kind of dreams, we have to start with knowing that God is good. A God dream is born out of faith, but it takes faith to see it come to fruition. And the way we keep our faith is to know that God is good even when things hurt. I got news for you. God didn't cause what you're going through. If you're going through something, say, well, God made this happen. No, he didn't. The enemy made it happen. Somebody made that happen. Sin caused that to happen. He didn't cause it, but he will use it for your benefit. He's got a plan and he will use it for your benefit if you don't lose faith. Faith dreams are the kind of dreams that live on after we're gone, and those are the kinds of dreams that we want to dream here today. So I just encourage every person, if you're here today and you don't know the Lord, could you just bow your heads and close your eyes? First of all, I want to tell you that he loves you so much and cares for you so much. I want to give you an opportunity, those that are watching online, those in this room, to get your life and your heart right with Jesus. Nothing more important than that today. It's really important for you to know how loved you are. It's really important to, for you to know that there's nothing you can do to make God love you more. It's really important to know that God knew every mistake that you would ever make. While he was dying on that cross, Jesus knew every bad thing and he loved you anyways. He loved you on your worst day. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you'll be saved. I believe that there are people here today that don't know the Lord. And that if you were to walk out of this room right now, or you were to walk away from watching this podcast online right now without getting your heart right with God, that you'd be in danger of being lost. I believe the Holy Spirit is moving in this room, right now, moving on hearts, convicting you. I would say if that's you, right now, no one looking around, no one, not a single person, if you need Jesus to be the Lord of your life right now, just lift your hand, no one's looking around. Lift your hand all over the building, hands going up every section all over this building, that's dozens of hands all over the place. The Lord sees your hands everywhere. Thank you. Those of you that are online, could you lift your hand if that's you or type in the chat and say, I'm lifting my hand, I need Jesus. Would you pray this prayer out loud? Say, I ask you, Lord, to forgive me of my sins. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. I want to know you. I can't earn my way into heaven. It's only through your love that I can find you and know my true purpose. I believe you're good, fully good. So I live a life of faith from this day forward, following after Jesus. My sin is behind me. Brand new spirit life in front of me. Teach me to follow you and I'll serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, could we give God an amazing praise today? so many people in this room and online that gave their hearts to the Lord. This concludes the teaching. If you'd like to support what God is doing here at City of Life, click on the Give button at www.col.tv or text a dollar amount to the number 855-997-6900. We hope you'll join us again.